Okay, so now let us move to the next discussion, and we won't finish, um, but it's about John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, because it's the classic defense of liberty. In English, we say liberty or freedom. Those terms are the same. They're interchangeable. In Chinese, we just say 自由,对不对? 中文没有别的词,有吗? 只有自由,对不对? In English, there's two terms, liberty or freedom. They mean basically the same thing. So don't get confused by the terminology. This is the most famous defense of uh, liberty. Um, but the question is, is it really purely distinctive to the West, or do you have similar elements, for example, in Chinese philosophy? So before we begin the lecture on, on liberty, I want you to look at a passage from the Luen Yu, from the Analects. And I want you to ask, I want to ask you, you read it now, and then I go to the second part. Now we go to the second part. I want to ask you about this last line here. Ru bu shan ar mo zhi wei ye, bu ji hu yi yan ar wei feng hu. What does that mean? Why does he say that? Why is there? Why is it that this one line, if there's one line that could really lead to the destruction of the state, why is it this line? Wei shen ma? Why does he say that? I want you to think about that. Ah, Chinese Gan 就是这里国家他并就是他他们这种还有其他的一些国军或者类似这种什么嗯风嗯风火系诸侯这种行为它是一种嗯就是一种嗯不正当的一种这种决策吧。OK，但是会导致亡国呢？有没有有没有一些例
this, how does this relate to John Stuart Mill's On Liberty? We will see that a very important reason for liberty is that we need liberty in order to promote truth and to expose wrong ideas. If I'm a leader and nobody criticizes me and I have a wrong idea and I try to implement that idea, it may well lead to the destruction of the state, right? That is Kungza's point. You, so Kungza, he would agree that if you, any government leader, no government leader is infallible. So, because nobody is infallible, therefore, the leader always needs people to criticize him or her so that he or she could learn from the mistakes, avoid making the mistakes, and help the country to progress. This, is, this argument is a very old one in Chinese history, but it's one that was developed in the 19th century by John Stuart Mill in 1859. Let's look at some of his views. Well, first we have to say a little bit about John Stuart Mill. He was from England, and I think he was the most important 19th century Anglophone thinker. He wasn't just a thinker. He was also a philosopher and a political leader. He was a member of parliament for the Liberal Party, and he was a very important, we would say today, businessman. The East India Company, which basically ruled India and was responsible for the opium trade here in China, he was a very important leader in that. He was in charge of examinations for the East India Company. They had to select top leaders in the East India Company. He was in charge of the examinations. His own father, James Mill, had the exact same position. They were, to be put it a bit differently, very involved in the imperial colonies of the United Kingdom at the time. His father, James Mill, was a close friend of Jeremy Bentham, who was a founder of utilitarianism. It's a simple idea that an act or, or policy is justified if it promotes the happiness of the largest number of people. Okay? If, I, if I'm a leader and I look at whether my policy is justified, I ask a simple question. Will it benefit the majority of people? Will it make the majority of people happy? John Stuart Mill's father and his father's friend, Jeremy Bentham, were both utilitarian thinkers and that strongly influenced John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill was a very brilliant child, Shen Tong. He was a child prodigy. When he was two or three years old, he would, he would read uh, ancient Greek and eventually ancient Latin. By the time he was 10 or 12, he was doing very complex philosophy um, and, he, and, and engaging in arguments with his father, James Mill, and his father's friend, Jeremy Bentham. You know, absolute, we can say, Genius. Um, and later on, he always maintained this extreme intelligence. He wrote three books that are still hugely influential today. One is the book that we're going to examine today, On Liberty, Lun Ziyou. He also wrote a famous book 
on utilitarianism, you know, Gung Li Zhui. And he wrote a very famous book, Considerations on Representative Government, which is a defense of democracy. He wrote these books. They're still very clear and beautiful to read today. He had people say, like, if I, uh, many professors today in China and the West, they aim to write a textbook, a keben, that will sell lots of copies you know, for a long time, because it's, it's, a, it's a way, to be frank, also of making money. Nobody other than John Stuart Mill had the almost godlike ability to write textbooks. These three books on liberty, on utilitarianism, and democracy are still arguably the best places now to read if you, about those things. If you want to study utilitarianism, liberty, or democracy, you have to read his textbooks, okay? Still now, he was a child prodigy, Shen Tong, but he had a purely intellectual upbringing. He was so brilliant, reading all the time. He had a nervous breakdown. He felt so terrible. Why? He asked a simple question. He said, I know what utilitarianism is. I know what a just society is. If I live in a perfectly rational and just society, would I be happy? He looked in his heart and he said, no, I'd be sad. And when he thought of that, it plunged him into a deep depression. How did he get out of that depression? By reading poetry. The poetry of William Wordsworth. Wordsworth, uh, Wordsworth you meant, it's, he's a very famous romantic poet from the 19th century. Okay, anyway. Um, he's a very famous romantic poet. Very moving, touches the emotions. And when John Stuart Mill read it, he says, ah, finally, it's not just about rationality. It's also about feeling, about feeling happy. And then he came out of his depression. And then a few years later, he met a woman, Harriet Taylor. The book on liberty is dedicated to her, right? Tapa Neben Shu Shenge, Harriet Taylor, okay? You read the dedication. He met her and fell in a very deep love with her. He was young, he was about 23. The problem is that she was already married. Well, she loved him too, but she also loved her husband. So basically, for about 18 or 19 years, the three of them spent a lot of time together. Um, Harriet Taylor remained married with her husband, and then John Stuart Mill would spend a lot of private time with Harriet Taylor. We don't know if they, you know, whatever. We don't know the details of what happened. We do know simple things, like they would go to the zoo, you know, Dongwuyuan, and they would go to the a zoo where there's a, 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 the part of the zoo where there's a rhinoceros. Rhinoceros, we push out the mushroom. Rhinoceros, um, yeah, rhinoceros. You mentioned that one? Rhinoceros. Shinyo, Shinyo, Nimendrodama, Shinyo, Handa, yet Bijao Kai. So, why did he go to the, see the rhinoceros 
and her, with Harriet Taylor because he knew that everybody looks at the rhinoceros and they would have privacy to, you know, kiss and talk and so on, right? So, 大家都关注犀牛, 不关注他们, you know? So, um, they lived this kind of life for nearly 20 years, and then her husband died, and then they married. But she died only a few years after they were married. In fact, a year or two before he wrote this book on liberty, and he dedicated this book to her. It's a very moving story, and there's a debate now about to what extent she actually contributed to this book. I mean, maybe, maybe she was the really even more brilliant mind behind this book. Because Mill also wrote another book called The Subjection of Women, Tapiping Dananza Jui. He criticized patriarchy, and he was one of the first, I think the second politician in the UK to argue for giving equal voting rights to women, which only happened later, uh, but he argued for it. And that book too, arguably, was very influenced by Harriet Taylor, this woman that he was deeply in love with. I don't think they had children because when uh, they married, I think she was already, you know, not that young, and she died shortly thereafter. But anyway, um, now let us look at his idea. In fact, it's a very simple idea, but he was the one who put it in a very systematic way. Remember, political theory is you know, it's he can't if he just said, "Oh, the harm principle," and didn't write anything else about it. No, people would forget about it. He wrote a very systematic defense of this simple idea. The harm principle, Shanghai Yuanzi. What is the problem here? The problem is, I'm an individual, right? We, let's say we, we have two individuals here. At what point can I interfere with you and can you not interfere with me? We have boundaries, right? I can't hit you and you can't hit me, right? I mean, obviously. Um, so the question is, the boundaries between individuals, what principle can we use to determine those boundaries? Now, before John Stuart Mill, there was no principle. It just depended on custom, xi su, Different people, different cultures, different societies have different ideas. You know, some people think it's okay for the teacher to hit the student. We, we don't agree, right? So, um, it's okay. You don't, um, and some people thought it's okay. What's the principle? He said, we need to use reason, li xing. Um, only then can we have a principle? And the principle, of course, is this harm principle. Power can only be exercised against a person's will to prevent harm to others. I can say things to you. You can say things to me. The police cannot come and, and force me not to say that or force you not to say that. But if I harm you, then the police could come and stop me from doing that. That's the basic idea. It's a simple idea. We can do what we want so long as we don't harm other people. Okay? And harm, in his view, is something physical. It's really physical harm. You know, it hurts the body. If you say things that harm me, you know, okay, fine. 
that you can't use the police, I can't use the, the police to stop you from saying that, according to him. But if you come and attack me, punch me, and you say, I don't like your course, then the police can come and stop you from doing that. That's a simple idea, but it's a very powerful idea, right? And he gave some very powerful reasons to do for that idea. Individuals are free to do what they want, so long as their actions, but this is very interesting too, or inactions do not harm other people. Wu Wei you show for example, if I have a child and I do not give any food to that child, it's an inaction, but I'm harming the child physically, right? So the police can come and put me in jail for not giving food to my child. So it's not just action, it's inaction. Wu Wei also matters, okay? This is going to be very important later, so keep that uh, in mind. An individual's own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant for interference. If I decide that I want to engage in risky activity, for example, if I like to do, um, well, bungee jumping, how to say bung, what's a, yeah, how to say bung, bungee, bungee, if I decide to do that, it's my choice. I decide to take the risk. The state cannot come and stop me from doing that. If I decide to have a lot of alcohol, it's my choice. The state cannot come and stop me from drinking alcohol. This is the key. The state can only exercise power when I harm others, not when I harm myself. Okay? That's the principle. It's a very simple principle. We can argue whether we agree with it. We will argue. But first, let's try to understand what he's saying. Okay? But there are exceptions. The first is children. He assumes that people are rational and have the capacity to make rational choices as to the way of life. But children don't, right? A five-year-old doesn't have, cannot in a rational manner often assess what is a risky behavior. The five-year-old needs to be told and needs to be forced. If my five-year-old child wants to look outside the window and nearly fall out the window, I can force him not to do that. Um, but if you decide to do that, I cannot do it because you're not children anymore, right? I think I would do it anyway, but I, anyway, I, from, more, from Mills, according to Mills' theory, I should not interfere, okay? The second part is much more dubious, his view is that some civilizations are barbarian, Yemanren, you know, and those people are not rational. And he had civilizations in mind, India and China, those colonies, he thought, people in those colonies were not rational, and therefore they, the harm principle does not apply to them because they're like children. This is the ugliest part of his theory. Obviously, for us, you know, we'll argue about it, and I assume criticize it, um, but his basic idea is that some people, whether children or what he called barbarians, those people are, cannot use rational mind in a, in a good way, and therefore, we can, we meaning the government, 
can use power against them, even if they're not happy about it, even if they're not harming anybody else. This is his theory. Uh, the children part is much less controversial, obviously. We think children are not that rational often, and we can exercise power against them, right? But this part obviously is, you know, from a, temporary, from a contemporary viewpoint, very ugly. And remember, he was, who else was writing around the same time? You know, 160年左右. Who had a very different view about economic interests and how economic interests influence your ideas? Hmm? Marx, exactly. Marx would have looked at this and he says, Oof, John Stuart Mill works for the East Asia Company, exploiting those colonies, making money. And then justifying it, saying that they're barbarians, Marx, in this sense, had a much more clear idea, you know, I think, in this way. Okay? Anyway, we can talk about it. Why exactly? Now, the, now we have to give the reasons. What are the reasons he gave for the harm principle? Shema Leo. And remember, the ultimate reason. The ultimate justification is utilitarianism because it contributes to happiness. It has good consequences. But what exactly are the good consequences of the harm principle? Why, if we follow the harm principle, why does that lead to happiness? And why does it have good consequences? He's going to give three reasons. The first reason is very similar to the one that we just saw with Kongzi, okay? And maybe the, and maybe the, the, the third reason too. What is the first reason? The first reason, look, I have an opinion, you have an opinion, and if I say you're not allowed to express your opinion, I put you in jail, I kill you, what is the likely, what is a very possible consequence of that? We may be losing the truth. Maybe your opinion is very valuable and we're losing the truth. What are some examples of that that you could think of? Let's first think of Western history. Or, I mean, it could be Chinese history too. What are some examples where people were not allowed to express their views? And because of that, we lost the, a lot of the truth of what they had to say. Think of some examples. Okay. Okay, good. So, in the 19... 19- 50s, you had uh, a movement called McCarthyism, which was meant to, and which actually stopped often left wing intellectuals who had very good ideas, they, they were stopped from expressing their views. And it led to a lo- uh, losing a lot of the truth in those days, including, to be frank, ideas about China. Um, so that's why in those days, some American leaders did not have very good views about China because those who were kind of sympathetic to China felt afraid to express their views. And as a result, that part of the truth was lost. What are some other examples? Yishua? Uh, Uh, Exactly. So Socrates was a brilliant philosopher who was charged with corrupting the youth of his day and he was sentenced to death by a jury in ancient Athens and therefore 
obviously could not express his views, and we lost a lot of the truth once he was executed. Luckily, his student, Plato, recorded many of his views and could publish uh, books expressing those views. Or another example, maybe even more, even more clear, it might be Galileo. Galileo, you went to Meshul. What happened to Galileo? He was not permitted to sh expose the truth at the time. Now we know it is the truth, right? That the earth um, goes around the sun. Um, and he was not permitted to express that view. So obviously, in, the, in his day, we lost that truth. So clearly, there are so many examples where if an opinion is silenced, we may be losing the truth. But John Stuart Mill has another idea. He says, even if the opinion which is silenced, which is not allowed to be expressed, even if it's wrong, at least mainly wrong, it may still contain part of the truth. So, oh, oh, 时间已经到了吗 ？OK， 我们下次讨论。你们继续读这些 PPT， 然后我我我建议你们已经读过第一章，你们可以读第二章。OK， 录音只有的第二章，然后想我们看这些，你们要想一想，有没有例子好吗？用通过例子，我们都可以理解，好吗 ？OK， 那下个礼拜见，嗯。